Hey guys, it's Miss Harvey coming to you again on Tuesday, March 24th to teach you some math. So right now in front of you, you should have your packet opened up to Tuesday's math lesson, or you should have it online on another tab. Scroll down to Tuesday's math lesson. You should also have a pencil, scratch paper if you need it in order to solve problems. Pause the video here and make sure you have all those materials ready to go. Okay, so I didn't get any suggestions for songs for this video. So that makes me think um, one of two things. Either that nobody is watching the videos till the end or that you guys love my music so much that you're fine with whatever I play and you didn't feel the need to send a suggestion. I'm gonna go with the second one, hoping that you guys love my music so much that you didn't need a suggestion, um, you you felt confident in whatever I was gonna play. Really, really hoping that everybody is watching the videos all the way until the end. If you're not doing that, make that a goal for yourself for today. Tuesday, March 24th, to watch all three videos all the way through, all the way to the end, okay? We're gonna start math class by going over the first problem together. Go ahead and reread the problem to yourself quietly so you know exactly what it was asking. Okay, so this problem was four parts or three parts. So we're going to go over all three parts um, in the, in separately. Um, so let's start with part A. It says to list the girls in order from largest sneaker size to the smallest sneaker size. And I know that up here in the table, I was given each girl's um, sneaker size in centimeters. Okay. So in order to figure out which numbers were larger or smaller, I used the stacking method <clears throat> over to the right hand side. So I stacked all of my numbers by place value, um, making sure to line up all the place values so that I could um, figure out which one is smaller or larger um, accurately. So I know that when I'm using the stacking method, I have to start at the largest place value and work my way to the right. Starting at the largest place value is the tens place. All of the digits are the same, so they all have the same value there. So I'm gonna move over to the next place value. And I'm gonna continue this method as I go along in order to help me figure out the largest and smallest numbers. So I noticed that the two um, numbers in the middle, Nora's sneaker and Yari's sneaker, they both have sixes in the ones place. So those are obviously smaller than the um, measurements with the sevens in the one place. I'm gonna start with those. Then I'm gonna go to the next largest place value, the tenths place. Yari has a seven in the tenths place while Nor has a two. I know seven is larger than two. So I know that the smallest sneaker is going to be Nor's sneaker, um, 16 and 25 hundredths. And then I'm gonna continue with that strategy in order to be able to um, label them from largest to smallest. My final answer is on the screen as you see it there. So I want you to take a look at your work and um, notice if you use the stacking method or not. If you did not use the stacking method, I want you to go ahead and redo part A using the stacking method to prove your work so that you can accurately um, compare the decimals. So right now you're picking up your pencil paper, you're doing that if you hadn't already, but if you realize that your work used the stacking method and you, that you got the correct answer, then you're all set. Pause the video now to do that. Okay, so you should have been checking your work and redoing it, or you are moving on with us to part B. What is the difference in size between the smallest and largest shoe size? So our answer to part A is going to be super important to help us figure out our answer to part B. In part A, we know that the largest sneaker size was Kelsey's 17 and 99 
hundredths. And the smallest was Norris, 16 and 25 hundredths. If I want to figure out the difference between these two numbers, I know I'm going to be doing subtraction. So I set up my subtraction algorithm. I made sure to stack my numbers by place value so that I am subtracting the correct place values from each other. I made sure that my algorithm is neat so that I do not make any silly mistakes. You should be checking your work right now against mine. And if you realize that you made a mistake using the subtraction algorithm, you are going to edit that right now. Pause the video and do that. Moving on to part C. If the girls were to line up their sneakers, estimate the length of the line of sneakers to the nearest tenth. So in this problem, it's important to notice two different things. It's important to notice that they are asking you to estimate. And it's also important to notice that they're asking you to estimate to a certain place value. It's to the nearest tenth. So I know that I need to be one rounding because I'm estimating here. And I know that I also need to be rounding to the nearest tenth. As you can see from my work, I set up a separate number line for each of the girls and I label them with the first letter of their names so that I could keep track of my work. For each number line, I used my two endpoints and my midpoint to figure out what tenth the number would round to, whether it would round up or whether it would round down. Right now, I want you to check over your work and I want you asking yourselves, how did I figure out what to round each person's measurement to for the nearest tenth? If you're noticing that you did not use a number line, then you now are picking up your pencil so that you can use a number line in order to round each girl's measurement to the nearest tenth. Pause the video and do that now. Okay, so if you are realizing that after pausing the video and attempting to use the number line, that you're having issues rounding using the number line, maybe you don't know how to come up with your midpoint, maybe you're confused on when to round up and when to round down, you need to now make a note for yourself that you are going to reach out to your teacher at the end of this video to get help on rounding so that your teacher can have a conference with you on rounding. After I rounded each girl's measurement to the nearest tenth, I know that I have to combine them because it says if the girls were to line up their sneakers. So I need to add each of the numbers that I rounded to in order to get the total length of the line of sneakers. So I added together 18, 16 and 3 tenths, 16 and 8 tenths, and 17 holes. Again, I use this addition algorithm in order to do that. I should have an addition sign here to make that super clear. I use addition and I ended up getting a final answer of 68 and 1 tenth. So the total combined length of the sneakers to the nearest tenth was 68 and 1 tenth. As a review, the way that I solved this problem is I used two steps. First, I needed to round each girl's measurement to the nearest tenth, and then I added them up to get the length of the line of sneakers to the nearest tenth. This second page was fact power. You're gonna go ahead and check your fact power answers against mine, making sure that if you have any questions, you're putting a star next to them um, so that you know to reach out to your teacher to get a conference on that specific type of question. Pause the video and do that now. Specifically for powers of 10, if you were having issues multiplying and dividing by powers of 10, I jotted down a couple of notes that will help you um, since I know a lot of us don't have our math notebooks with us. So if you would like to use this as a resource, something that you can do is you can stop the video here and use, the, use this notes as a resource while you are completing the practice. And that's if you just need it in order to help you um, remember. And if you don't, then you're continuing and we're moving on to the next problem. The next page was conversions. 
um, using the gallon conversions that we learned a couple of weeks ago. So here was another time where we don't have our math notebooks, so you may have needed to advocate for yourself um, by researching the conversion facts in order to help yourself know um, what conversions you will use to solve the problems, okay? Another resource that you can use is the gallon chart that is going to be in the folder with all of our work. So I will upload a conversions that you should know um, to help you memorize them of all of the conversions between gallon, quarts, pints, cups, and ounces that we learned so that you can use that as a resource in order to help you solve problems like this in the future. Right now, you are noticing, or you should be noticing, that for every single problem, I use a table and a number sentence in order to solve. Because I know that whenever I'm doing conversions, I need to have a table to figure out what operation I'm doing and by how much. And then I need a number sentence to figure out my unknown. Right now, you should be checking your work against mine. And if you see that you did not use a table and a number sentence, you're immediately picking up your pencil and you're starting to revise your work. Pause the video here and do that. If you're noticing that you use the table in a number sentence and that it benefited you in order to help you find the correct answers, that's awesome. If you had problems with any of them, put a star next to them, reach out to your teacher so that they can have a quick conference with you on how to solve. Okay, so we're gonna go over the next three problems together um, and they have to do with conversions. So if you got really great practice and you went back and revised the problems before this, then you're gonna be super prepared to go over these with me um, and to check your work. So the first one says, Miss Blair filled her aquarium using a measuring cup. Altogether, she added 100 cups of water. How many quarts will that be? Automatically, I noticed that they're giving us 100 cups of water and they want us to figure out how many quarts are equivalent to 100 cups. So I know that I need to figure out what is the conversion fact between quarts and cups. And that is the first line of my table. I know that one quart is equal to four cups. In order to go from quarts to cups, I notice that one quart is four cups. So multiplication happened there, they multiplied by four. One times four equals four. To go from cups to quarts, we went from four to one. Four divided by four equals one. So I know to go from cups to quarts, I need to divide by four. I know that Miss Blair filled the aquarium with 100 cups. So I filled in 100 underneath the cups column. And I wanna figure out how many quarts that is. Next, I'm gonna write my number sentence. My number sentence should be 100 divided by four, and that'll help me figure out how many quarts it is. And I should have ended up with the answer, 25 quarts. If you found that you did not use a table in a number sentence and that it didn't benefit you, then you're going to go ahead to the next two problems on this page and you're going to use the strategy that I just used in number one to help you be more successful with two and three. Pause the video here and do that now. The next problem says the driver of a large dump truck filled his gas tank with 36 gallons of diesel fuel. How many quarts will that be? Immediately, I notice that the 36 is in the unit of gallons, and I need to figure out how many quarts that is going to be. I'm going to make a table showing gallons and quarts. For one gallon, I know it is equivalent to four quarts. Right now, I want you to go ahead and tell yourself, using the table, what operation would you need to do? Go, to go from gallons to quarts, and what operation would you need to do to go from quarts to gallon?
You should have said that to go from gallons to quart, you need to multiply because one times four equals four. You should have said to go from quarts to gallon, you need to divide. Divide by four because four divided by four equals one. I went ahead and filled in 36 underneath gallons. Then I need to use a number sentence to figure out how many quarts that is. Notice that my table tells me what operation to do and by how much. So it sets me up for success. 36 times four is going to equal the number of quarts. I know that 36 gallons is equivalent to 144 quarts. I'm showing my work with multiplication by using an algorithm to the right side. The last problem says a newborn baby was given eight ounces of formula two times a day for a week. How many ounces were consumed that week? How many pints would the mother need to prepare for one week? Here, it's super important that you use your annotating skills because there are lots of pieces of information you need to make sure you have from this problem. I know that the baby is being fed eight ounces, but it's two times a day for a week. And then I know that they are, the first question I need to answer is, how many ounces were consumed in one week? So I'm gonna underline that in a different color. So that's the first part that we're gonna try and answer together. And I did part one at the top of my working space. So for part one, I need to figure out how many ounces the baby eats in one week. But first I need to realize that there are seven days in one week. So if I was given the amount that the baby eats each day, I need to figure out how many days are in a week. Seven days are in one week. And I know that the baby is being fed two times a day. So that means that the baby is fed 14 times in a week because there are seven days in a week and they are being fed two times a day. Seven times two equals 14. So they're fed 14 times a week with seven, with eight ounces in each feeding. So that means that I'm gonna be repeatedly adding eight ounces 14 times. Or instead of doing repeated addition, I can use multiplication. 14 times eight equals the amount of ounces that the baby will eat in one week and that means that they will eat 112 ounces each week. Now I'm gonna attack the second part of the problem. How many pints would the mother need to prepare for one week? So we're working with the same amount of time here. It's still one week, so that means that we can use our answer from part A to help us with part B. So if I know that they are being fed 112 ounces in a week, I have to convert those ounces to pints. One pint is equal to 16 ounces. Right now I want you to say out loud to yourself, what operation and by how much do you need to do to get from pints to ounces? What operation and by how much to get from ounces to pints? Pause the video and say that to yourself. You should have said that to go from pints to ounces, you need to multiply by 16. And to go from ounces to pints, you need to divide by 16. I know that the baby had 112 ounces a week. 112 divided by 16 will tell me how many pints that is. And in order to do that, I would use repeated subtraction. Not showcasing the repeated subtraction here because that's not the focus point of this problem, but you should have that work somewhere on your paper. 112 divided by 16 equals seven pints per week. That was a lot of practice that we just did on conversions. If you're feeling like conversions are still really tricky for you, you should jot down a note now to reach out to your teacher today for a conversions conference. If you're having issues using the strategy of a table and a number sentence, reach out to your teacher so that they can help you learn that strategy. 
So it's super helpful. For the next page of work, we're not going to go through each problem. So what you should be doing in order to advocate for yourself is you should be checking your work against mine. If you're noticing that you did not show all of your work, if you did not use the appropriate strategies, then you're going to pick up your pencil and revise your work so that you can get that good practice. Pause the video here and do that now. This last page was more rounding practice, which I think is going to be really good if you are feeling at all confused on the first problem that we did with the rounding. So we're going to do one of the number lines together, and then you are going to practice the strategy on your own for the other three. So this problem wanted us to round the following number to each place value listed below. Our number was 199 and 912 thousandths. First, we needed to round to the nearest whole. I set up a number line because I know that rounding without a number line is not going to set me up for success because I'm not gonna be able to visualize and see where my number is and whether I should round up or down. Number lines take two extra seconds because all you have to do is put down your endpoints and your midpoint. So if you're hesitant to use a number line because you think it takes too much time, it's better to spend the extra two seconds making a number line and get the answer correct and show your work rather than jotting down an answer super quickly and missing points. That's a way you can advocate for yourself is by going the extra step taking the extra time and showing your work with the correct strategies. So I'm going to start off by drawing an empty number line and I wanna put my two endpoints. If I'm rounding to the nearest hole, then I need to be looking at the digit in the ones place. Every digit before the ones place is going to stay the same. So the one and the nine in the hundreds and the tens place will automatically be in my first endpoint. Then the digit in the ones place will also automatically be in my first endpoint. Every digit after the ones place, we are going to ignore because we are rounding to the nearest hole. So my first endpoint should be 199. To get my next endpoint, I need to think what is one hole more than 199. 199 plus 1 is 200. So my next endpoint should be 200. In order to come up with my midpoint, I need to use the same digits from my first endpoint. So the 199 stays the same. And then I know I put a 5 in the next biggest place value. The next biggest place value is the tenths place. So I put a five in the tenths place. My midpoint is 199 and five tenths. Then I place my original number onto my number line. 199 and 912 thousandths goes after my midpoint of 199 and 5 tenths because the 9 in the tenths place is bigger than the 5 in the tenths place. So I put it somewhere around here. I know that if my number is after the midpoint, I round up. So I round it up to 200. When I round to the nearest hole, my answer should be 200. Right now, if you did not use this strategy in order to round for the other three problems, then you are going to set up your number lines and use this strategy of having your two endpoints and your midpoint to figure out how to round and whether to round up or down. 
pause the video here and do that now. Okay, thank you guys for your hard work. Rounding can sometimes be tricky. So if you're noticing that any of these were hard for you, rounding to the hundreds place, the tens place, or the tenths place, please make a note for yourself. Reach out to your teacher after this video so that you can get a conference on rounding. That concludes our math lesson for today. If you had any questions or concerns, please reach out to your teachers. Please make sure that you are finishing your work and editing it if you needed to go back and do anything. If you need extra practice, speak to your teacher. They can assign you extra practice on reflex or freckle. Um, and we can do whatever works best in order to support you. So go ahead and continue working on your ELA, grammar, reading and writing. Um, and I'll talk to you again tomorrow.